Okay, next speaker is Elizabeth Hillman. Elizabeth uh, was invited here today because she's an example of what it's a strong trend in the neurosciences of uh, developing techniques to address new questions. Uh, Elizabeth took her PhD at UCL in London in 2002 and then moved to MGH at Harvard in, uh, for, st for studying optical methods for addressing neuro neuroscientific questions and uh, uh, started her lab here at Columbia in 2006 and she's going to talk about important findings that she has been addressing with her technique of optical imaging in, yes, there was, in optical imaging in alive rodents. Okay. Hello? Okay. So uh, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and I apologize, I don't speak Italian. Um, so uh, as uh, Franco said, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, understanding neurovascular coupling uh, with intervital microscopy and optical imaging. So what is neurovascular coupling? Maybe it's a term that some of you haven't heard before. So what you probably know is that the brain relies on a rich blood supply, uh, which is locally modulated during functional stimulus. Okay, so um, you know, if I move my left hand, there's a, a region in my right somatosensory cortex which is going to uh, uh, increase its, its blood flow. And so we get a response that looks a little bit like this, an increase in oxyhemoglobin, a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin, and a slight increase in total hemoglobin. And this modulation is the basis of fMRI and near-infrared spectroscopy. So fMRI, you've all seen these maps, and I'm sure a lot of you in the room are, are familiar with or use fMRI. Um, this signal that you're detecting with fMRI is actually a, a, a decrease in deoxyhemoglobin in the brain during a functional response. The thing is that very little is understood about how and why blood flow is modulated in the brain. Um, it's, if you look back at this, it's actually a little curious. You do this stimulus, so this gray region here corresponds to stimulating the pore of a, of a rat, um, and then you see an increase in oxygenation in the area where you are stimulating, not a decrease, not something that's uh, reporting that the neurons are using oxygen and therefore there's a decrease in oxygenation, it's an increase in oxygenation. So it's something that the brain is actually doing in response to the fact that there are neurons firing, and therefore it really is a hemodynamic response to activity, it's not just some consequence of the fact that neurons are firing. The other thing that's a little curious that's bothered people for a long time is, is how slow the response is. The neurons are actually firing during this uh, period here. So this is calcium imaging, so the neurons here are firing as you're doing the stimulation, but the response is only really peaking after everything's finished. And so, you know, if this really were something that was vital for neurons to be able to actually fire, um, it's way too late uh, to provide anything useful. So um, it draws the question, like, what on earth is this response actually doing? You know, maybe it's just there to deliver glucose and it's got nothing to do with oxygen. Um, but that makes everything very concerning for functional MRI where you're measuring these signals of this change in deoxyhemoglobin and you're assuming that it corresponds to a change in neuronal activity. So what do we want, what do we worry about? Well, we, we look at this and we say, okay, well, I wonder what kinds of cells are actually mediating this change in blood flow. And, and that's the sort of mechanistic approach I've taken to it. I'm a physicist by training, so I like to sort of take things apart and try and figure out what's going on. Uh, so I said, well, you know, what, what cells cause blood vessels to change? And I found this nice figure um, by McVicker, and um, he's drawn all of these different cells here that might be involved in neurovascular coupling. Um, and as you'll see, they're all the cells in the brain, so astrocytes, parasites, interneurons, and neurons, all of them may or may not be involved in somehow uh, propagating this, this message between neurons that are firing and blood vessels that need to change. And so we became really fascinated with this and trying to actually get to the bottom of what's going on. Um, one of the things that I think has is, is meant that it's taken a while for people to get to this problem, firstly, because people didn't really care about blood flow until fMRI, um, but secondly, this is really, really difficult to study in vitro. Once you do a brain slice, you've, you've cut away the central nervous system, you've cut away the, the circulatory system, you, you don't have uh, a pressurized blood flow, it's very, very difficult to study this. So we force ourselves to study this in vivo, in the intact, living brain, um, which then presents all kinds of problems for us in trying to actually get the information out of the intact brain without causing disruption to the blood flow or the neuronal activity. So what specifically are we studying in my lab? Well, the first one is what is the meaning of the hemodynamic changes that we see? What does it actually represent when you see a blood flow change? Does, what does that correspond to uh, within the brain? 
Also, how does that response actually manifest at the vascular level? So the vasculature of the brain, this is a cross-section through the cortex, has this wonderful structure to it with these surface arterioles and surface veins diving down to the capillary beds. And when we see this blood flow increase, what does that actually mean in terms of which vessels are dilating and constricting and what's changing in which of those compartments? And that hopefully leads us to what's actually doing that uh, change, uh, what's actually mediating that change in the blood vessels and therefore hopefully where the signals are coming from that are doing that. And you know, once we've sort of got that figured out, how do we actually see any of these changes, um, a change during disease and development? So um, there's a lot of evidence that things like Alzheimer's, obviously stroke, um, and even age-related neurodegeneration might be related to a, 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 a a decay in this neurovascular coupling, the ability of the brain to provide this blood flow increase every time there's neuronal activity. And so, uh, you know, how, how, what happens if this system gets broken? It seems like it could be a very important place to look for drug targets. Um, and the other one is, is baseline behavior the same as activation? And this is a sort of new area that's coming up where, you know, there was this idea that when you stimulate the brain, it sort of does something magical that's different to what it's doing in its baseline state. But really, our brain is never in a baseline state because we're always doing something. So we're looking at that also. Okay, so what sort of techniques are we using? Well, this is really very, very standard, very basic. So we work in rats. I apologize. I know most people here are doing primates. Um, but here's our, our rat. We basically expose the cortex, and we can do something very simple, just shine a light onto the surface of the cortex and take a picture with a camera. And in this case, when we stimulate the whisker barrel of this animal, we can see this nice change in intensity of the light that we get back. That's corresponding to a change in the uh, absorption of the blood in the, uh, in the tissue. Oxy and deoxyhemoglobin have different colors, so basically by using different colors of light we can figure out what the oxygenation state of the, the blood change is, and we can make maps that show the change in oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, and total hemoglobin. And the reason why these images are kind of uh, fuzzy looking is because we actually took them in, in an fMRI system, just to sort of get our baseline and to figure out uh, exactly you know, whether what we were seeing with our optical techniques really corresponded to the bold signal in fMRI. And so we built this cute little rig, this is my sort of to neurotechniques. Um, here's our little rig where we, we did a, a cortical exposure here in the rat. We have a little endoscope here that's shining light onto the surface of the brain while we've also got it in a nice little MRI coil and then we put it into a 4.7 Tesla magnet and we're able to simultaneously get readings of the hemodynamic response and the MRI response. And so this is the plane uh, here we're actually imaging in this sort of like oblique plane that's going through the somatosensory cortex. And we were actually lucky enough to get signal here that they use this to sort of um, combat people who are a little skeptical about fMRI. This is real-time single trial movie. Uh, this top area is fMRI, so this is the sort of oblique plane that we're imaging in. This region here corresponds to the optical region of interest here, which you'll see in these movies. So if I play the movie, you'll see every time we stimulate, there's kind of a blue patch that appears in the fMRI and, and corresponds corresponding uh, oxy-deoxy-total patches, and you see the time course is down here. The black trace is from the fMRI, and the red, green, and blue is from oxy-total and deoxyhemoglobin. And so you can see that we're really truly seeing the same signal in this animal. And if we sort of zoom in even closer, um, I've, I've flipped the bold signal here to show um, it next to the deoxyhemoglobin signal. Even all those little waves and bumps and lumps that we see in the background are correlating very well. So we're very confident that you know, what we're looking at here is corresponding to the fMRI signal. So then we don't do fMRI anymore, um, and we go and say, well, what can we do now to get really much, much closer? We don't like these sort of blobs of, of, oh, this region's active. We want to really get down and see what's going on. So we wanted to do really high-resolution imaging and really, really high-speed imaging, which is something that fMRI really struggles with. Um, so here's that spectrum of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin that I should have had in my earlier slide. Uh, as you can see, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin have different absorption spectrums. This is wavelength. And so if we choose different wavelengths of light, like blue light, green light, yellow light, red light, we're going to have different sensitivities to oxy and deoxyhemoglobin and that's how we can extract uh, those uh, concentrations from our images. And this is a, a really relatively simple system. All we do is we uh, uh, flash uh, green and blue LEDs on and off really fast in synchrony with the camera, um, which allows us to get very high speed um, data. And we can go up to three wavelengths, we can do up to 200 frames a second, um, we can synchronize it with stimulus delivery, um, we can do unlimited acquisition. And we've actually um, uh, put a sort of recipe for building this system and all the software free online if anybody wants to build their own. It costs about $5,000 to put together. Um, Here's our, our three wavelength system, and uh, we can do fluorescence. I'll show you this a bit later if we just put a filter in here. <laughs> 
So what do we get to see? So here's our actual exposed cortex. So we take off the dura, we take off the skull, we, we zoom right in, we get these really beautiful high resolution images. Now we're looking direct, directly at the vasculature of the somatosensory cortex. Compare this to the blobs that you get with your fMRI. And so this is going to be now a movie of what we see in that region uh, when we do a four second um, uh, hind paw stimulus in the rat. Um, one thing that we get for free is because we're taking images of the baseline uh, um, uh, uh, tissue with, with different wavelengths, we can easily make these maps that, that show the arterioles versus the veins versus the parenchyma just based on their different baseline oxygenation values. So here's the movie. So this is total hemoglobin, oxy and deoxy. The stimulus comes on now and you see this evolution of the response. Now you can see the arteries here dilating. You can see changes in oxygenation of the blood in the draining veins. Um, and that's all a little bit difficult to digest really, but one more time. Okay, so there's all different regions changing at different times. Different regions have different changes in oxygenation versus total. It's all a, a big mess, basically. <laughs> So, uh, what can we extract from these big movies? Well, we can extract a lot of information. So, we already showed compartment separation, being able to see the arteries from the veins. Even in this draining vein, we can even watch how the sort of oxyhemoglobin uh, rich blood from this branch is kind of blending with the oxygenation, uh, deoxygenated blood from the other branch, which is kind of cool. We can zoom in and actually look at the actual physical dilation of the vessels. So, we can see here that the, the artery here is dilating uh, quite markedly, but the vein here is not dilating at all. And we can also get actually the speed of flow of the blood just because we're going so fast we can actually watch the red blood cells moving along and we can carry, ca uh, calculate how fast they're going. So we have all this information which is a, a great deal more to understand what's going on than if you just had a blob. Um, and we can here, this is just extracting actually the time courses of different regions. So this is the artery here, this is the vein and the capillary. And again, you can see very different time courses, very different amplitudes of the changes. If you particularly look at the deoxyhemoglobin, they're very different changes. Um, and we can sort of unmix those and represent you know, what parts of the signal are corresponding to the arteries red there, the, the veins uh, blue and the green parenchyma. And we can go even further. So. Uh, the point here again is remember that when you when you get this blob measurement with fMRI and this time course from fMRI, you're getting this all of this stuff mixed in together. And it gets worse if you even look. There's even signals from these more distant veins and more distant arteries that also have what appear to be responding time courses, but you're not looking at that central capillary region, which is really basically what you're supposed to be focusing on, in principle. When we talk about that in a minute. Okay, so we've sort of now got this really rich data and we started to say, well, how is this response initiated? If we're going to understand what does it mean, we, we need to figure out how does it start, who tells it to start, and, and which cells tell it to start, and how does it grow from there, and when does it start? Because, you know, is it really an anomaly that, that this blood flow response is so late compared to the neuronal activity? So here's a sort of time sequence that we have of the total hemoglobin changes, and you can see some interesting things here. For example, right here, so the stimulus started at six seconds, Seconds, even within half a second, you can sort of see a blushing of the capillary bed, like a, a darkening uh, um, of the capillary bed corresponding to an increase in total hemoglobin. Then you can see this dilation of the arteries that sort of is spreading away from the central responding region. And then at the end, this, this blue around here shows a constriction of the arteries at the edges, an actual active constriction going below baseline. And at the very end, you actually sort of have this sustained sort of glut of red blood cells stuck in, in, in the capillary beds. So my very talented student, Brenda, who is hopefully here, um, uh, did an awful lot of work on this, really analyzing this data to death and going through and really trying to characterize exactly where does the response start, how does it start, when does it start. Um, and we came up with really that it, it quite categorically starts in the parenchyma and then moves to the arterioles. And this might not seem terribly interesting to you guys, but um, for us it's, it's, it's very important because it tells us that it's not a sort of feed forward thing, it's a, it's a feed backwards thing. Um, we were also able to actually look at the propagation along the arterial so we could see that it genuinely does propagate away from the, re the, the region, although it seems like the, the decay actually propagates backwards, inwards. And uh, we can look at all the, you know, the directions of those propagations when we move the region, uh, of, of the responding region. 
And basically, um, one of the really important things here is that we found that those propagations of dilation are independent of the direction of flow in the vessels, which rules out a whole load of, of hypotheses about sort of downstream propagation of metabolites and that kind of thing. That this is a very much vascular uh, sort of network phenomenon, as far as we can tell. So, uh, you know, we found that parenchyma goes first, arterial dilation propagates very quickly, uh, you know, four, five, six millimeters per second, which was faster than, than had ever been predicted and therefore no one had ever seen it because no one had measured fast enough. Um, dilation direction is independent of flow and the constriction dynamics, so this sort of close out of the response at the end, really has very different spatiotemporal properties to the onset and so it really points to there being kind of two pieces to the hemodynamic response, one which is a sort of excitatory dilatory part and one which is a sort of shut down everything at the end part which, which uh, uh, leads to a lot of interesting possibilities. And so, you know, we, we sort of now trying to put this together into a model. So it seems that the first change is this sort of rapid increase in total hemoglobin in, in the capillary bed. Then you've got this vasodilation which spreads. You've got the uh, uh, independent of the flow direction. The stimulus stops, the response actually returns to baseline at the periphery and then moves inwards so it's not that the central region is releasing dilators and then constrictors because that would cause a ring to go outwards whereas it actually closes in backwards. Um, and this capillary hyperemia is the last return to baseline. Uh, so, you know, we have all of these new things now that we want to look at and then we want to actually see if we can find the mechanisms that go along with this and therefore hopefully get back to what caused them in the first place. Um, just for those of you that do primates, um, I just wanted to show a little data that we've got uh, in collaboration with Anaruda Das. Well, he got the data and, and, and I did the calculations. Um, but uh, uh, we wanted to sort of just show that what we were looking at here wasn't just a function of the fact we were using rats. This is a weight behaving primate data in the visual cortex. And when we do our conversion to oxy, deoxy, and total hemoglobin, we see very similar results. We see nice uh, increase in oxy, decrease in deoxy, increase in total. Um, and this sort of relates to those of you that may have been hearing about the initial dip or may be used to seeing intrinsic signal imaging where you see this sort of big change at the beginning. Um, we can do a similar sort of uh, looking at the time courses from the arteries and the veins and capillaries and we can even sort of unmix them in that spatial way to just pick out the, the responding capillary region from the arteries and veins that have different time courses. Um, but this is the work that uh, Anna Ruder and I uh, did together where um, we, we looked at this initial dip. This is the signal that people have been measuring for a long time at the standard sort of intrinsic signal optical imaging folk have been imaging at, at 605 or 630 under the assumption that they're sensitive to deoxyhemoglobin and that they're seeing this signal that there's this nice big dip that occurs right at the beginning and that that dip is corresponding to a deoxygenation of that region which is corresponding to those neurons gobbling up all the oxygen which is what, you know, really makes sense and makes people feel warm and fuzzy that, that they're seeing a signal which genuinely is, you know, hungry neurons. But um, unfortunately what we, we, what we showed was just by really getting to the bottom of the spectroscopy and the physics of how the light's going in there and what's going on with the hemoglobin, that when we convert this data properly to oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, we actually get rid of that dip and it goes away. And if we really analyze it, we see that the reason you see this dip is because of that very early increase in total hemoglobin, um, which causes this sort of anomalous uh, uh, signal change. And so this rapid increase in capillary uh, hemoglobin is again what we saw in our other results and really points to the mechanism being very different. So, so um, unfortunately that warm and fuzzy uh, uh, initial dip um, thing does not like, yeah, you know, okay, don't start an argument. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, it doesn't appear to be uh, what's there. It's certainly not what you're measuring when you're using these standard wavelengths. Um, but it points, therefore, to there being a very bizarre mechanism of, of somehow that the brain's first response to neuronal activity, and very quickly, I don't know if you saw it, it was about 400 milliseconds, is able to somehow increase the number of red blood cells in the capillary bed right next to where the neurons are firing. And that's the signal that we all want. Okay, so then the question is how on earth does that happen? And so one of the main things that we wanted to look at to begin with is, is astrocytes because you've probably seen in the last few years there's been a lot of publicity about uh, astrocytes being involved in neurovascular coupling and, and a lot of that was based on some early sort of observations where we, this is our sort of classic picture of a diving arteriole here and you can see, you know, Again, we've just drawn in all of the possible cells that might be involved. Maybe there's some afferents from the thalamus, and maybe there's interneurons, and maybe there's end feet. Um, if you look at this data here, this is two-photo microscopy of this diving arteriole, and what this paper showed was if you uncage calcium in that uh, uh, astrocyte, you can see 
an increase in the in the di the dilation of the vessel. So this has been sort of the work that's been pointing towards astrocytes being the thing that's involved in initiating and controlling the hemodynamic response. However, we were very concerned because typically astrocytes have been been understood to have very limited influence over long distances. They're sort of described as having very discrete domains, just sort of patches that they, they're a little master of their own little region, but they don't really communicate over long distances. And so we're trying to explain this incredibly rapid, orchestrated response with dilation spreading over m several millimeters of the tissue within you know, a few hundred milliseconds. And so we wanted to see whether these small observations of sort of one astrocyte seeming to have some influence on one vessel could really explain the entire orchestration of the response. And so uh, uh, we moved to um, another technique, which is in vivo two-photon microscopy. And again, being physicists, we built our own system, specifically designed it to really uh, uh, be perfect for doing in vivo imaging, be incredibly adaptable to get very, very fast imaging, multiple wavelengths, um, as deep as we could possibly go. Um, and so we start out, here's our camera image of the cortex. Um, this is a two photon image where we've put uh, dextran conjugated fluorescein into the bloodstream so we can see the contrast of the vessels. These little black dots correspond to the red blood cells so we can see those moving around. Well, we can also use a dye called sulforodamine shown here in, in cyan, which is taken up by astrocytes in vivo. And it's, it's a fantastic tool. You just drop a little bit of this dye on and all the astrocytes gobble up this dye. Um, and so now what we can do uh, is in vivo we can look at the astrocytes and how they're relating to the blood vessel. So here the blood is shown in red and the astrocytes are, this is an astrocyte on a diving vessel. This is not coming out terribly well, but you can see these astrocytes are really reaching out to and, and grabbing around these blood vessels, grabbing around the capillaries. And until I got this data, I was, I was not enamored with astrocytes at all. I just thought they were these sort of dumb little cells that probably didn't do anything useful or important. And when we saw these images, we, they, they just love blood vessels. They love blood vessels. They're always holding onto them and grabbing onto them. But one of the things we really noticed was when we started to get this data in vivo, so in the intact brain with you know, proper perfused blood flow and we could actually look at this in 3D, we found it really didn't look a lot like a lot of the diagrams that people have been drawing of astrocytes for years. And so we sort of thought, well, maybe we need to start just by looking at the sort of in vivo histology organization of astrocytes because we couldn't find anywhere in the literature that, that anybody had done a real sort of proper um, examination of that. So I had this fantastic uh, post-bac student uh, who spent many hours taking data. This is now a movie stack going down through the cortex of the mouse, down beyond layer four, and uh, looking at now the astrocytes are shown in red and the vessels are shown in, in, in green. Um, and so we can sort of render that. This is the astrocytes throughout that block. This is the vessels throughout that block. And then this is the two mixed together. There's a picture of him. Um, and, uh, you know, now we can actually watch not just sort of in single horrible slices from histology where the vessels have disappeared and you're not sure what's, what level you were at and certainly where you don't get the peel vasculature because it always gets ripped off when you're trying to do your histology. Now we can actually examine this entire thing, go up and down, look at the density relations of the astrocytes relative to the blood vessels. And we found some really interesting things. So I'm not going to go into this in, in great detail, but we, we found this wrapping. We, uh, we found all kinds of interesting things. We did a lot of histology to uh, immunohistochemistry to, uh, to, to you know, figure out that we really were seeing what we thought we did. We used transgenic mice here, so this is in vivo imaging of um, type 2 GFP mice that have uh, GFP in their endothelial cells or uh, GFAP G GFP to, to do uh, um, proper uh, uh, co-registration. And so we, we, we came out with this sort of uh, new vision of, of, of what's going on with the astrocytes in the cortex. And, and the first thing that we found was that there's this sheath that I was kind of trying to show you. There's this wrapping of, of processes from astrocytes around blood vessels. And we knew that. And people said, well, look, there's this sheath of astrocytes around all of the diving arterioles, so that must be what's happening. Well, we found that there was this sheath, but it was wrapping everything, all the arteries, all the veins, all the capillaries. It was absolutely continuous. We also found about 98% of all the astrocytes that we saw were holding onto a blood vessel. Right? Not, there weren't any that were just sitting around doing nothing. They all seemed to be holding onto a blood vessel. And so we got really intrigued by this. And actually a paper came out while we were writing our paper that showed that actually when the astrocytes hold onto those blood vessels, they form gap junctions. And so what we actually think we might have seen is, is the sort of this signaling conduit that, that if all astrocytes are holding onto all the blood vessels and all the blood vessels are all continuous, then you actually have a way that the astrocytes could be communicating over long distances and along the vasculature. So 
I was kind of actually a bit upset because I was hoping this was going to prove that uh, that astrocytes had nothing to do with it. But it actually, it looks like astrocytes um, really have a lot uh, uh, going on that might mean that they could feasibly signal along the vasculature. Um, we found also just from a, from a, a sort of experimental point of view that this dye that we're using, sulforodamine, somehow also stains peel arterioles. And we did a lot of work to prove that actually the staining that people see on peel arterioles is not from astrocytes, um, which sort of was very surprising since this dye is incredibly specific to astrocytes. And what we found was actually that it's staining uh, uh, arterial endothelial cells, and only arterial endothelial cells, not venous endothelial cells. Um, and so we actually think that might be really interesting, either that the arterial endothelial cells have some common factor to astrocytes, or even potentially that the astrocytes are somewhere forming gap junctions with the arterial endothelial cells, which also could make them now part of this network that could propagate that uh, vasodilation over long distances. Um, and all in all, though, because we saw this sort of uh, uh, sheathing everywhere, it really suggests that uh, um, arterioles aren't the only place to look and that um, you know, we're now actually really focusing down on the capillary bed to see whether astrocyte involvement there could be what's causing that initial uh, capillary um, hyperemia. So I've only really shown you blood vessels so far and obviously we want to paint over this a, a, an idea of what's going on with the neurons because that's the sort of missing piece of information or actually to measure the function of cells rather than just the morphology. So we use calcium sensitive dye imaging, um, probably most of you are familiar with this, you, we have to do pressure injection, bulk loading of the dye into the cortex, so you put the dye in, it's a, a BAP to 1 AM dye so it only becomes fluorescent when it's inside the neuron, uh, it loads into the neuron, you wait a while and then when you stimulate the neuron you have an influx of calcium and that increase in calcium causes an increase in intensity uh, in the neuron flash. So now if we use our, our camera system again, and in this case now we're imaging with blue and green light, the blue light is exciting green fluorescence and so if we're flashing these two things on at the same time and we put an emission filter in here, we can simultaneously measure the changes in reflectance which correspond to the hemoglobin uh, changes and the changes in the calcium and um, we've pressure injected at multiple sites here in the brain. So this is wide field imaging of the calcium response and so now we play our movie as we stimulate this is the calcium response goes bang 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 with every three hertz uh, four pore stimulus and then we see our classical hemodynamic response there that goes along with it. And this is sort of where we get that data where we can really show the, how these two things are, are uncoupled. Um, we can then take that same animal into the two photon and we can do our high speed two photon imaging at the same level so we can see those same flashes and extract those same time courses at the cellular level and so rather than really trying to do electrophysiology in vivo by poking things all into the, the all different places in the, in the brain when we're trying to deal with it we're trying to sort of do non-contact electrophysiology by imaging using calcium sensitive dyes and what's nice about the calcium sensitive dyes is if you uh, uh, load them up with this sulforodamine dye you can also get signals that delineate between signals from astrocytes versus signals from neurons. And so here we can see uh, uh, that firing signal looks, that's coming from the neurons, but we can also see these slow transients in different regions corresponding to changes in calcium in the astrocytes. And so this is now, now we've looked at the morphology of the astrocytes, we're tr still trying to figure out what their role might be. And what we find, and what uh, several other people have now found, is that the astrocytes seem to be doing something related to the hemodynamic response, but they're very slow. They don't seem to actually sort of see what's going on until quite a lot later. And although the hemodynamic response is slow, it starts very quickly. It starts within about half a second. And so um, this is sort of pointing to uh, our, our latest theory, which is that um, perhaps the, the astrocytes are involved in sustaining the hemodynamic response and are involved in sort of maintaining it after a certain period of time when an, there has actually been a buildup of glutamate or, or there is actually a genuine need for more metabolites as opposed to uh, that initial uh, uh, onset which we think may be neuronal. Um, and so we know that astrocytes seem to have some connectivity that could make them play a role but these results suggest that they may not respond quickly enough and that's as I say building, letting leading us to a model where we think actually different cells might play different roles in the onset, the sustaining, and the, and the return decay phase. Okay, so just finally, um, this is our sort of uh, uh, cheeky slide where we say, well, what about metabolism? So the why? All of this, all of this hemodynamic response, you know, we, we talked about the, the initial dip. Um, 
w w what's actually going on that's needing this hemodynamic response? And so we've been looking at metabolism, and one of the, so you all know <laughs> cellular respiration. Um, one of the lovely things about nature is that uh, uh, NADH um, is fluorescent, and uh, NAD plus is not, and FAD is fluorescent, and FADH2 is not. So that means that if we can measure NADH, uh, if we see changes on their own, then we're looking at anaerobic metabolism, and if we see changes that are um, um, complementary between FAD and NADH, then we're looking at oxidative metabolism. And so we really wanted to get, the, get to the bottom of whether we were, uh, what was going on with the actual metabolism in the cells corresponding to the blood flow to see whether that metabolism was actually the trigger that was calling the blood flow to come in. And so uh, using our camera imaging, we can get FAD fluorescence. So again, we just put a filter in here. Um, now we can measure the hemodynamic response in this animal, uh, followed by the FAD response. And we can then overlay what's happening with the oxidative metabolism in the brain, um, spatially and temporally, compared to the hemodynamic response. Um, this is work done by my postdoc, Barbara. Um, and we can also do NADH, so again we image using the camera. If we go into the two photon, we don't put any dye into the animal at all. We see beautiful fluorescence still. This blue color is coming from NADH fluorescence. And we can stimulate the animal and we can see these nice transients in NADH as well. And so um, what we're really trying to get at, oh sorry, and we can also, this is a work in progress, we're using uh, uh, cortical injections of a fluorescent glucose analog and we can actually see that fluorescent glucose analog being taken up by astrocytes and neurons. And so what we're really trying to get at is um, some of these energy hypotheses about the way that uh, uh, astrocytes can potentially be providing energy substrates to neurons. And some of these results that we have seem to be pointing towards uh, 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 picking out these, these parts of the hemodynamic response and then allowing us to relate them to the control of blood flow. Um, just one last little teaser, since I'm sure you're all wishing you had that um, chocolate class on for breakfast. Um, this is what happens in the brain when you're doing nothing at all. So when you're staring at this thinking, when's she going to finish? Um, if you look at this map, so this is the changes in total hemoglobin. This is a bilateral uh, exposure of the somatosensory cortex in the rat. And, and this is just doing nothing. This is just not stimulating the animal at all. It's actually on ketamine anesthesia. Um, but we see these time courses, if we look at them in terms of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, they're wobbling away. They're oscillating away. And we've got these great waves. They're sort of occurring at the same time on both sides. So they're sort of rolling and, and, and stormy. Um, we stare at these a lot in our lab. Um, and, and so what's really interesting here is a lot of you probably heard of functional connectivity mapping in fMRI. And it's become a really new, exciting area to look at where instead of doing actual stimulus in an fMRI system, you just look at these baseline activity uh, 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 activities. And, and the idea is that you can pick one region. And if you find another region that's behaving in the same way, then it must be somehow functionally connected. It must be somehow neuronally connected. And um, so, you know, we can do that with our data. If we pick a seed region over here and we look for all the other regions correlating, we can see quite nice correspondence between two regions on, on opposite sides of the uh, somatosensory cortex. Um, the thing is, we can actually look at, you know, what, how those vary with oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, turtle hemoglobin, and relate that back to fMRI. Um, so what we're getting really interested in now is, because we're seeing these changes even in the resting brain, um, you know, how do they actually uh, uh, relate to what's going on in the brain when the brain's at rest? And how does this relate to this new functional connectivity mapping that everybody's uh, fond of in fMRI? And, and, you know, we're sort of uh, wondering whether, um, and I know Anna Rood is probably going to talk about this too, whether uh, uh, these kinds of variations could be purely passive, could just be the vessels just exercising and flexing their muscles, or this could be actual underlying brain activity that's really showing how the brain's organizing itself and communicating with itself when it's not being asked to do one specific task, or maybe even could be related to attention, or even that, that somehow this blood flow modulation could in itself be somehow tuning the gain of the neuronal responses in some way that you sort of attention span of 10 seconds is sort of coming and going from different regions of the cortex. So that's that's our slightly ethereal part. And um, so, you know, if you're interested, we have a, a website with lots of information. I uh, acknowledge the work of my students um, who, who did a lot of this and of my funding. And thank you very much. We have time for a few questions.
can be up to the same magnitude. It really depends. So, I mean, what I showed there was these oscillations, and the oscillatory state tends to, to come and go. Um, although, I mean, I've seen it in my own brain, so I know it's not just because, you know, the rat's sick or something like that. It, 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 you see it in infants, you see it in all kinds of different places. But that wave isn't always there. Sometimes when they do functional connectivity mapping, they're looking at um, the lower frequency fluctuations that are more stochastic. Um, so, I mean, we're really interested in... in when and when that when and where that wave actually onsets and how it comes. Sometimes we would see if we stimulate the animal, we'll see the hemodynamic response, and then the wave will carry on, and that wave can kind of lock into the hemodynamic response and actually kind of increase it. Um, so, I mean, I wish I, I wish I knew all about that wave and all about the other low frequency oscillations, and and hopefully we'll learn more as we work um, more on this. But uh, um, it's yeah, it's very big. It's, it, it, it could feasibly really confuse people if they were looking at that and not necessarily their neuronal response. David Alamiki? The fMRI response. In terms of the metabolism? The relationship between the metabolism, the, 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 those, uh, those variables you're measuring, and the components uh, of the internet. So. I don't think that the, the, uh, the observations that have been used to support the lactate shuttle hypothesis have been um, mostly in vivo up until this point. Very much sort of like I take a dish of astrocytes and they do this when I put glutamate on them. Or I take, yeah, there's been some brain slice observations, but the responses there were very, very slow. So I was imagining that we would see much faster responses. And we seem to be seeing things that are consistent with the in vitro observations. And that suggests to me that the current interpretation that, oh, well, in vivo, they're probably a lot faster, and then it will all make sense. I, I'm not sure. I, I think we're seeing things that are consistent with the previous observations, which were cited as being consistent with the lactate shuttle hypothesis, but I'm not completely sure that that it works exactly the way that people think. Um, I think the biggest thing to take away from it is that those responses do seem to be also slow. And so my, my favorite theory right now is this sort of three-phase piece that I was talking about, where it seems that there are cells in the brain that are wells placed to sense that activity is going on and to respond to the fact that activity is going on and that they need to bring in blood flow. But I don't think that necessarily they are what starts. They are what causes that initial increase in blood flow. I think that that initial increase in blood flow also almost becomes reflex in the brain, that every time there is an input to the cortex, there's also some demand, some, some you know, command that says there's going to need to be blood flow. And that then those other cells are related to sustaining that if there, there gets to be a buildup. And, and so when we see those changes in metabolism, they seem to be slow and on the order of those kinds of signals. So I, I think there's maybe part of the confusion throughout is that there are like fMRI results that use long stimuli versus short stimuli, and people look at maps from the beginning, from the middle, from the end, and I think there are different things going on between each piece. Um, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. There is, well, there is a PO2 change. So, so that's, that is actually important. There, people that stick PO2 electrodes in there actually do see a nice dip. There is a, an increase in oxygen consumption followed by an overshoot caused by that influx of blood. The point is that that is not what you measure when you measure the blood. You want to ask it? Is that a short question? Yeah. Um, functional connectivity implies that if you were to deactivate one somatosensory cortex, you might not see similar waves in the other kind of somatosensory cortex, that they were actually connected. So put some potassium on one cortex and see what happens. We're actually looking at it in a glioma model. So we've, we've got sort of models where we've got nasty things happening on one side, and we're trying to look at you know how they get affected by that. But 
yeah, potassium is probably a lot easier. <laughs> Did you? Well, if I knew that. <laughs> no, a lot, a lot is pointing to, um, I mean, interneurons can express a lot of different vasoactive substances, NO and, 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 and all kinds of things. We know that there are lots of afferents that come from the thalamus. We know that there are VIP interneurons that go all the way from the thalamus up to, to layer one. So there are a lot of sort of structures that are in place. And I mentioned at the beginning we were interested in actually development and the way that the hemodynamic response develops. And one of the really intriguing things we found is that in, in human studies looking at newborn infants, the hemodynamic response is quite different. It actually seems to have characteristics of being immature and not having developed that sort of initial uh, piece. And so we wonder if it could be related to sort of structural migration of, you know, connections forming over time and then figuring out how to make that response as quick as it can be.